Know any Taoists out there? I know I do because I was one for a long time. I really doubted. I, I wasn't exactly sure. I knew who Jesus was. Yeah, I had heard about him. Yes, I, I had grown up knowing who he was, and yet I didn't really know him. Resurrection Sunday is not just a day to say, I know he's alive, but do we know him? Do we know Jesus for who he really is? The Apostle Paul told the early Christians, not just that they needed to know certain things and needed to follow certain commands, but they needed to know Jesus. It's not just enough to just do what he says to do, but do you know him and do you know him intimately? Because it really makes a difference. The more we know him, the more we allow him to shape our heart, to forgive us and help us, the more we can in turn love other people and give them the break that God has given us. Paul told the Ephesians in one of his early letters, he says, I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. There's hope to this thing. And he says, the riches of his glorious inheritance, that you may know that, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. So it's not just that we know today, but do we really know who he is? Because as we know Jesus, we will have a hope, a confidence to keep going in the midst of trials. We will have riches that money can't buy. I mean deep-seated riches and a peace that, that is beyond understanding. And we also have a power, the same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead. That power is available for you and me to overcome our problems from the past, the lingering resentment and all the other stuff that kind of gets in the way of love. And so today, we're going to look at who Jesus is. And we're going to look at six very important images of Jesus that we find in the Bible. And the first is one of our favorites. It's the image of Jesus as a little baby. I love Christmas, and I love the Christmas story. This is a wonderful story for us. And I think the reason we love this little baby is it's so, it's so cuddly. It makes you feel warm and tender all over. Brody Cortina is going to come and read for us the wonderful story of Christ's birth. While they, were in Beth While they were in Bethlehem, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all of the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Luke 2, 6 to 11. Amen. Isn't it amazing that the first to hear about Christ's birth were the shepherds? <laughs> if the angels had gone to learned scholars, they would have probably had to go to their commentaries to find out if the angels were really correct. If the angels had gone to the rich and famous, they would have had to check their schedules. Well, do we need to go? I don't know. My, my schedule's much too busy. But no, the angels went to shepherds, those who didn't have a reputation they needed to protect those who didn't have an ax to grind or a ladder to climb. The first announcement went to shepherds. It's really interesting that the only account that we have of Christ's birth, the actual time when Christ was born, is in the Gospel of Luke. And in the Gospel of Matthew, that gives us the little story of the wise men visiting the child Jesus. But the Gospels of Mark and John, they don't even include the birth story or Christ's childhood. It's almost as if they didn't want that to get in the way. 
If you would have been here in the United States in, let, let's say, around 200 years ago, the Puritans had made it almost impossible to celebrate Christmas because they didn't want it to overshadow Christ's death and resurrection. So what did they do? They actually made a law, and you could go to jail for celebrating Christmas. I'm really glad that we celebrate Christmas. I love Christmas time. And one of the reasons is that Jesus arrived here not just as a human being, but he arrived as a little baby, vulnerable, lovable. Max Lucado says that God was given eyebrows. He was given elbows, two kidneys, and a spleen. He came not as a flash of light or as an unapproachable conqueror, but as one whose first cries were heard by a peasant girl and a very sleepy carpenter. Jesus arrived here as a vulnerable little baby. And you know what's so beautiful about that? It makes Jesus approachable. It makes God approachable. We don't have to have our act together before we come to him. His humble birth is a welcome mat. It's like God is saying, I'm here, I'm listening, and I know in a very personal way what you're going through and what it means to be helpless. That means we can go to Jesus, just like those shepherds did, and know that we are safe and we are loved just the way we are. There's a second image of Jesus that we have, and this is the image of Jesus as a great teacher. It's very beautiful that the very first thing that Jesus did when he came out of the desert, remember he was tempted by the devil for 40 days, 40 nights, he fasted, and he came out of the desert, and the very first thing the Gospels tell us is Jesus began to teach. He went to the synagogues to teach his own Jewish families. Imagine what it must have been like that Sabbath when Jesus walked in to the synagogue in Nazareth and he began to open the scroll of Isaiah and he began to read. Here was Joseph's son speaking before his own hometown, letting them know he was much more than a carpenter. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. When his hometown heard that, Everybody was amazed at the gracious words coming from Christ's lips. They just didn't know what to do, and they, they were praising him. They, they were amazed and in awe. But then it happened. Jesus began to imply that the kingdom of God would not just include them, but would include Gentiles as well. And that didn't go over well. His hometown actually took Jesus out of town and wanted to throw him off a cliff. Now, I began to think about this, and sometimes we too can be just as fickle. We too, at times, can listen to Christ's teachings, and those teachings that we don't like, well, sometimes we just kind of put them aside. As long as Christ's teachings do not rock our boat or don't require too much from us or to love or a lot of sacrifice, he's wonderful. But the moment Christ's teachings begin to really shake our life, begin to change our priorities, begin to change the way we think and the way we treat others, then at times we don't know what to do and quite often we can pull back or we just put those commands on the shelf. Jesus told his disciples, if you love me, obey my commands. And I began to think, what are the commands that Jesus has given us that are sometimes hard to follow? I mean, it's one thing to say, Lord, I love you. I really do with my whole heart, my whole soul, my mind and my strength. I'm yours. I'm in. But what about the teachings that say, 
do not worry. Do not envy. Do not worry. Do not judge. Do not worry. Do not lie. Do not hate your neighbors, but love them. Do not hate your enemies, but love them. Pray for them and bless them. Are any of these teachings hard for us? Based on how we live, have Christ's teachings hit home? I'm glad because many in our church family are learning a lot from Jesus. And it doesn't matter how old we are or how young we are. The Lord is always teaching us, and we always have something to learn. Hear these words from some of the folks in our own church family who are learning a lot from Jesus. What God is teaching me is how to keep my mouth shut. For instance, with my children, I have learned that I need to listen to them. They don't often want or need my advice, but they just want me to listen to them. And sometimes that takes more of an effort on my part because I want to fix everything. And the Lord says, no, you leave that to me. So I'm learning to listen to them, really listen to them. I have a new calling, is to give the teens and young adults and them who need it, Bibles. They are just my testimony of what I needed all the time, is a Bible close to me. And that's what I enjoy, giving Bibles to young people. Jesus is teaching me to be more patient with myself um, because uh, I would, I've always been real frustrated with myself. And so he's kind of guiding me and showing me how, how to learn to be softer with myself. In the last few years, I've changed jobs several times. And during that time, God has always, always been relevant in my life. He has watched over me through unemployment, through job changes, and he's bringing it to bear today of what I need from him and what he needs from me. God's teaching me to lead others as he leads me, especially with the youth band upstairs, just loving for them and caring for them and stepping in for them and just really asking and being curious about what their needs are and how I can pray for them. I, I feel more confident when I pray. I feel braver. I can ask him things that I maybe thought I couldn't ask before because I wasn't worthy enough. But you're worthy enough. You're always worthy enough. He does this to you. He, he changes you. He makes you feel like you're important and what you have to ask him is important because he knows it. Sometimes we don't know it, but he knows it's important. And he knows it's important to us. Well, I used to have a quite a terrible temper and God's helped me so much with that. I still have a few moments, but most of the time it's, God has really been good. So, But it's, it's in yielding to him that makes a difference. It's a total yielding to him. That's what it takes. One of the other images that we have of our Lord is that of a miracle worker. Oh, don't you just love the miracle stories? For every lame person who got up from the mat was able to stand and walk. Every person who was blind was able to see. Every tormented person who was freed from demons. Every single miracle pointed to the fact that Jesus wasn't just a miracle worker, but he was much more. 
Would you listen to some of the, the things that Jesus pulled off that only Jesus could have done, some of the miracles that took place? Jesus went throughout Galilee, healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread throughout all Syria. And the people brought to him all those who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed. And he healed Again, I love those miracle stories. I just think about what it must have been like to sit there with all those thousands of people when Jesus multiplied some loaves and fish into a mighty banquet with leftovers for thousands of people. I love the one where Jesus calms the sea, not once but twice in the accounts of the Gospels. And then there's that one where he's walking on water. Now that's a pretty good one. Another favorite one for me is when he healed the centurion's servant who was miles away. This servant was dying, and the Lord said, let it be done, and just like that, the servant was healed. It didn't matter how far away he was. Christ's power was able to go beyond the miles. It didn't matter how dead Lazarus was. Christ's power raised him from the dead. And while each miracle is different, each miracle points to the fact that Jesus is much more than a human being. He had the power of God. He was God. He was the Son of God. And Jesus told his followers, believe in the evidence of the miracles I have done. Then you will know that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Nothing was done in a whim. Nothing was done just to make people feel better. But it was all done to point to the fact that Jesus indeed was divine. And you know what's so beautiful? Is a lot of the miracles that Jesus did then, he's still doing today. This sanctuary this morning is filled with people who have been touched by the healing power of God. In a variety of ways, we've been helped, we've been touched. Sometimes you'll, you'll be somewhere and, and you don't have to say a long, heavy-duty prayer. I remember I was in a car accident years ago and all I could come up to say was, Jesus! And just then a car broadsided me, smashed my car to pieces. I'm the only one in the car. Glass went over me. Glass went in front of me. Glass went behind me, all landing on the passenger seat, and I was untouched. We have stories in this room. We can tell that God has done something in our lives, if not physically, then emotionally, and he continues to do it. I'd like you to hear some of the healing supernatural stories of transformation that God is doing. He's doing something new in all of us if we'll allow him. Listen to this. If you want to see a miracle, look at me. I have been a miracle from God from, oh, for a long, long time. I've learned to forgive. I've learned to give everything that I have up to him, which has brought me so much peace, extreme amount of peace, and the love of other people. I love people, I love our congregation, and I love everything about this church. God is at work in my life. He has brought me to a new place of being able to serve him in freedom and in dignity and now today I am free to serve our precious ladies on Tuesday coming alongside dear Carolyn Myers <laughs> to be able to serve the Lord with joy and gladness we are seeing miracles take place we are seeing 
God at work, we are seeing attitudes changed. We are seeing hope and healing and transformation. And I just want to give God all the glory and praise for what he is doing. The first few days after I was diagnosed with lung cancer were horrible days. I had a pity party that went on for days. And then it kind of came to me that I was not in this by myself, that I had the Lord with me all the time. And all I needed to do was to turn to him and he would provide everything that I needed. And so I got myself up off of my little pity blanket and wiped away the tears and here we are several months later and it's getting better and the tumor's shrinking. Thank you, Jesus, for all your amazing healing power. We've looked at Jesus as that approachable little baby so vulnerable, as a very wise, amazing teacher, one who commands us sometimes to take a step beyond where we ever thought we could go. He was a miracle worker. I mean, he did things that nobody else could do, but the real reason Jesus came was to be our Savior, to go to the cross and to die so that the price of our sins would be paid for. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. And that's what Jesus did. He willingly stepped forth and went to the cross and died for our sins. That's love. He stayed there and died for us. How lonely it would have been. Can you possibly begin to imagine what it was like when your own apostles abandon you, when one of them betrays you, when one of them denies you, not once but three times, really? How horrible, absolutely horrible it had to be to be tortured, to be mocked, to be spat upon, to be killed by those you created. But all the way to his last breath, Jesus expressed love. Remember while he was there on the cross? He forgave those who were killing him. He invited the thief who was dying next to him into paradise with him that day. And then he made sure that his mother was cared for, that the apostle John would take care of his beloved mom. That's love. Pastor Amy comes to share with us those last moments of Christ on the cross because before there's a resurrection, there has to be his death. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I don't know if we can fully grasp what was going on here, but that word, when he said, it is finished, in the original language, it's tied to the words, paid in full. Something happened. With that last breath, something happened. And it happened in the temple. In the temple in Jerusalem, there was a curtain that separated the rest of the temple from the Holy of Holies that very special place that symbolized the holy, holy presence of God. And nobody could go behind that curtain but the high priest. And only the high priest once a year could go behind that curtain to atone for the sins of Israel. Well, when Jesus took his final breath, you know the story. It's recorded in the Gospels. That curtain rent in two from top to bottom. It just tore in two symbolizing that anyone, not just the high priest, but that anybody could come into the holy presence of God. 
that nothing could separate us from God anymore, that at any time, at any place, anyone can come into God's holy presence. The Apostle John wrote about this. He said, Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice, not only to save us from sin, but to pave the way for us to go to heaven. But to get there, there's a death on our part as well. I pray that along the way, God's grace ignites an awareness of our need. And it also shows us that we need a change in our life and something needs to die. Our self-sufficiency that kind of puts God on the shelf. Something else needs to die, that fear that keeps me so bound all the time and robs me of joy. Something needs to die, like those sins that we've tried to hide that we just think God doesn't see. He does. Those attitudes that keep God and people from a distance, those things in our life need to go to pave the way for God's grace to do something new in us. I am so blessed that God died for me. Jesus went to that cross and he died for you. Because the grace that flowed down from Calvary that day still flows today. Forgiving our sins, taking care of that fear, and all the stuff that gets in the way of love. I pray that the very first who will see the change God is doing in us are those who know us the most. Our spouses, our kids, our friends, they can see the change that God is doing. I pray the change in you has begun. As a Catholic kid, I grew up, and I remember the crucifix in the old mission had Jesus on it, and most Catholics uh, do have the cross with the body of Christ on that cross. And the reason is beautiful, it's to remind us of the ultimate sacrifice Jesus paid for our sins. Now, as we go to a Protestant service, you'll notice that our cross is empty because we celebrate the fact that Jesus didn't just die, but hallelujah, he rose from the dead, and that cross is empty. I pray that our understanding of Jesus in some ways combines both, that we never forget the incredible sacrifice Jesus paid the love that took him to that cross and kept him there until the last sin was paid for. But Jesus didn't end there at the cross. His story doesn't even end at the tomb. The beauty is there's so much more to this story. See, the Romans sealed the tomb after Jesus was dead and placed inside. They sealed it so that no one could get in and no one could come out. They posted guards to make sure nothing would happen, that his body would not be stolen. But no one and nothing could keep God down. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him, they shook and became as dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know you're here looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. In our case, the earthquake was so big, the tomb fell over, the, the stone just fell over. <laughs> who knows? 
Jesus is not just the Savior who died. Mm -mm. Jesus is the Savior who rose from the dead. And it began with an earthquake. Anybody here who's ever been in an earthquake, it, it does rock your life. The soldiers were terrified. It's one thing to be in an earthquake. It's another thing when angels show up. And those angels talked to the women who came there to anoint Christ's body. They were the last with Jesus when he was dying on the cross, and they're the first to hear that he is alive. Isn't that lovely? One of those women was Mary Magdalene, who stayed in the garden. She stayed by the tomb, and she was absolutely devastated because Mary believed that somebody had gone into the tomb and had stolen Christ's body. And then it happened. She not only saw an angel, but the resurrected Christ appeared to Mary and called her by name, Mary. I love the fact that God's relationship with human beings, it all begins in a garden. I love the fact that it's very sad here that God's relationship with human beings is severed in a garden. Our relationship with God was damaged. In fact, all of creation was damaged greatly by the fall. But here we have Jesus back in a garden announcing a new creation has begun. Just as God breathed into the first man the ruach, the ruach of life to give him life, so Jesus today breathes into human beings a new life of hope, a new life of confidence and peace that can only come from God. I pray that we have experienced that. So many have really experienced the new life that only Jesus can bring. Would you listen to these resurrection stories? Jesus is, um, he's my savior. He, um, he rescued me, he's my hero. And he's not just for me, he's for everyone. He's the king of the world. Um, I don't have any skills, talents, or abilities, and the Lord has taken me and transformed me and he has a purpose for me. I had no purpose, no value in my life, didn't know where I was going or what God could do with me. Um, so I am involved in a ministry now where the way that I serve, I play with toys. Like I, we get toys as donations and part of what I do is I clean them off and I um, help get them ready to be a blessing to the family that receives them. And um, it just cracks me up because God has a job for me. I used to let frustrations get to me, let work troubles get to me, let um, a lot of problems bother me and hold me down. And now with the peace of Jesus, I feel free. I have that inner peace to let things go and handle my situations a little better. I was once an addict. I've been clean and sober for six months. We moved over here to start a whole new life, and it's been wonderful. This church has been wonderful. And God's wonderful. God has tr done a great thing in my life. Um, and I was once an addict, and um, I'm now clean and sober. And um, I'm, I found a great, wonderful church, and uh, God has really moving in my life. Uh, I'm new to the Tri Cities. Um, ever since I've been here and been to the Church of Nazarene Richland, um, just blessings has become. I'm, I'm now a new member of Ford in Tri Cities at Corwin, and uh, God is working, and uh, it's just been a great, wonderful feeling. So my testimony is uh, don't ever struggle and give up. Keep praying, and, 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 and God works, and uh, prayer works, and amen. That's all I can say. I'm happy, I'm blessed, and uh, I can't thank him enough. And what Jesus has done in Dimitri's life and in so many of our lives, Jesus wants to do in each one of us. All it takes is a step of faith. We may not understand the whole thing. We may not understand, and there have been things that we've seen in the church that may disappoint us, but the Lord says, child, follow me. And somebody here today, I can't think of a better day, somebody here today may need to cross that line to say, Lord, 
I want to believe whatever you've done for them, I want to believe you can do it for me. Whatever's been in my past, whatever's been done to me, whatever I'm still holding on to, you have the resurrection power to change my life. And so I want to open this up to you in the darkness. This is just between you and the Lord. Today may be the day that you say, Lord Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Would you bow your heads and let's just pray right now? Lord Jesus, we have heard so much about you this morning. And there is somebody here, I know there is somebody here who maybe is tired of going their own way. Maybe they are hearing your spirit speaking to them now. And maybe they're saying to you, Lord God, I need you. I've been trying to do this my own. I can't give up, but yet there's something in me that's telling me I need to invite you to forgive my sins today. There are things I've said. There are things I've been thinking. There are things I have done that I'm ashamed of. And Lord Jesus, would you forgive me right now? There are things about my life that I know need to change, and I can't do this myself. So I invite you, Lord Jesus, into my heart. Today is the day. Today is the day I'm going to cross that line, Lord God, and I'm going to believe you. I want to believe you, Lord God. Give me the faith to believe that you are the Son of God who died for my sins, and you rose from the grave, and that, Lord God, you are coming again. I want to be ready for you. Please, Lord, enable me to believe and to be a Christian and to follow you. I pray this in your beautiful name, Jesus. Amen. It's the most important decision you will ever make in your life because eternity is a long, long time. And an eternity without God just can't even be described. At some point, no matter what has been, no matter what we've done or whatever's been done to us, I pray in the name of Jesus, we will make that decision and know that we belong to Jesus Christ. Well, we've heard a lot about Jesus, and I do love the resurrection story, that Jesus is our Savior who died on the cross, and he rose from the grave. But there's one more image. Jesus is our eternal king. I love this, that remember Paul, he wrote that beautiful prayer, and that prayer goes on and it says, God has not only raised Jesus up, but has seated him at the right hand of the Father, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. He is above it all. And someday, Jesus will return, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord. Imagine the heavens splitting open, just like that curtain in the temple. The heavens split open and everything stops. Imagine presidents and kings bowing in his holy presence. Imagine politicians silenced. Oh, Lord, imagine it. May it be so. Imagine the fiercest of atheists numbed in the presence of our holy, holy God. As the voice of eternity speaks through the heavens and proclaims, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. So, brothers and sisters, here we are. <laughs> Today, we've celebrated the fact that Jesus has risen from the grave and he is alive. And it is an incredible fact to know that, to believe that, because it's on that truth that we stand as believers. Our Savior didn't just die, but he did something that no one has ever done, and that is he rose from the grave, and he is alive today. And today, as we have come together, I pray that we not only know that fact, that Jesus is alive, but we know that he is coming for us again. He's not just the cuddly little baby, the one that we can come close to, and that's very lovely. He's not just a great teacher who guides us and helps us along the way. He's not just a miracle worker that we can go to in a jam. He is not just even our Savior who died and rose for us, but he is the Lord of lords, and he is the King of kings. There are no words that we can possibly use to describe how we will bow before him when he comes back. But in the meantime, may we worship him. May we give him our praise. May we obey him and live for him with our whole heart. Let us praise the king. May our lives praise the king, for he is worthy. He is risen. 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 Now that's why we can live in the morning and give God praise from all through today through eternity. Thank you for coming this Resurrection Sunday. If you have a praise or a prayer to drop by and in the little collection plate, please do so. Would you turn to a brother or sister today and say, Hallelujah, it's been good to be in church today. Amen. Amen.